Hi, I'm the Chef Somberfield. <laughs> I thought I would try having just a little chat about my book called Marilyn, Not Just Another Girl, The Myth About Sleeping in the Nude. <laughs> okay, I don't want to get in trouble with YouTube here, so I really can't do too much, although I would love to um, be able to video a little more. So I figured I would talk about the book that I published. It came out in fall of 2019, and I'm actually in the process of um, finishing up public publishing a second book called Marilyn, Thereafter the Fall. And then I have a third book that's in the works called Marilyn, Blonde's Preferred Gentleman. But I, I figured for people who haven't read my first book, I would just go over some of what it's about. And um, I figured I would just kind of explain it and describe it because I know some people will see a book with Marilyn's picture on it and they'll think that it's all going to be a bunch of facts about Marilyn or a bunch of pictures about Marilyn. And Marilyn's picture isn't in this book because of copyright laws. So although I would have loved to have had a picture of her walking up the stairs and passing the actress studio sign, I don't have any pictures of Marilyn in this book. So this book, is over 300 pages. And the first chapter is called Marilyn Claimers Abound. Now, this just talks about the elephant in the room, which is that there are many other people who claim they were Marilyn. In my second book, I will discuss this further and talk about some of my interactions with other people, although I will protect their identities by using some code names. Chapter two. Who, uh, who am I during this current lifetime? Okay, it's about me. It gives you a little background on the family I grew up in, where I was born, and just a little bit about me. I was born 23 months after Marilyn died. Chapter number three, all those damn imperfections. Okay, this talks about what it was like for me growing up, basically at a time where supermodels and, and just sex symbols were all over the place on the screen. And I just felt so imperfect and, and I, I just hated the way I looked. And I basically ended up eventually having eating disorders. But I talk about all the things about myself I didn't like. Now, it's hard to tell how much of that was maybe subconscious because of past life stuff going on within me that I wasn't quite aware of yet, or how much of it was because I watched a lot of movies and TV and so I was focused on the really beautiful people, and how much of it was, you know, maybe because of things I heard around me, you know, comments people would make either about me or about other people, just just realizing that beauty is something that is stressed so much in society and, and sometimes in our daily lives, it seems, you know. Chapter number four, my inconvenient truth. Okay, chapter number four is about growing up with overactive bladder and having that really impact how many activities I became involved in, how uncomfortable or nervous I was a lot during my teen years. Um, just, just talking about how that really kind of sculpted some of my personality because I became a real homebody. I became really good at being independent and doing things on my own and, and didn't focus so much on having big groups of friends or being involved in activities outside the house. But I also was very shy and hadn't had a lot of experiences because of that as well. Chapter number five, you don't own me. Okay, I talk about going off to college and various aspects of that in this book. This talks about getting manipulated into a sexual relationship with a teacher and just, just that whole situation. But it also talks a lot about how just 
the put out or get out sort of mentality permeated everything at the time. You know, it almost seemed like if I wasn't, you know, willing to part with my virginity on a second or third date, it was like, get away. You know, it, it talks about just the pressure to have sex. And if you haven't by the time you've left high school, there's certainly a lot in the college setting. Okay. Chapter number six, why do I believe I was Marilyn? This talks about the beginning of my past life memories when I was 19. I wasn't meditating. I wasn't suspecting that reincarnation was real. I wasn't looking for excuses for anything. I started having past life memories. I think it's because I was taking acting classes on a regular basis in college. I think that kind of like, you know, kicked up some dust, some memory dust <laughs> or something. And I started having past life memories, but I also started remembering other lifetimes as well. So chapter number seven is called A Plethora of Past Lives, and that hits upon some of the other past lives I also remember. I am not just Marilyn reincarnated. I remember other lifetimes too. So I feel that I am the sum total of all of them. I am not just Marilyn's duplicate. I am not just Marilyn in my history. I'm many other lifetimes. And at this point, I remember 15 other lifetimes to varying degrees. Okay, so chapter number eight, the showbiz dropout. I talk about different reasons that I didn't follow through and end up in show business, even though I did study acting in college. And I went to a very good school as well. Okay. All those marvelous men who put me in crazy positions. So this is talking about all the crazy relationships and situations I got in during my 20s and 30s. Um, later on, I reprise a couple other flings I had within another chapter. But I talk about all the crazy relationships I got in. I talk about my four-year marriage. I talk about things that went wrong, my own mindset, my own immaturity, the crazy things that guys did. I talk about a lot of that. I think that's important. And we all know that Marilyn, you know, got involved with many, many men. Many were inappropriate. She had three divorces. So I wanted to talk openly about my situations. Okay. Chapter number 10, my skin cancer ordeal. I had skin cancer because Basically, I got a really bad curling iron burn right up here and didn't tend to it for years. And then after many years, it started changing and I finally went to a dermatologist, got it diagnosed and needed skin cancer surgery. But I go through how, how I neglected it, you know, how I was in denial, how I wasn't sufficiently prepared when I went in for surgery. I had no idea it was going to mess up my face as much as it did. It took me many, many months to stop feeling very uncomfortable on the inside, and my face was very swollen and mangled on the right side, and my eyes are still very uneven, as you can see, because of the way the skin was all cut up and pulled around and twisted around in order to cover a big gaping area here at my temple. So that's why I wear glasses now, actually, is just before I wore contacts, but now I wear glasses to try as much as possible to disguise the fact my eyes don't match up anymore. It was very traumatic. And actually, the trauma I went through, and it, it, it's in more detail in the book, obviously, but the trauma I went through is what made me think about, you know, coming out and, and telling people about my past lives because I was so depressed. I was really, you know, suicidal, thinking terrible thoughts all the time. And then I got to the point where I thought, I really need to come to grips with my karma all my life after I began having past life memories. That is, I felt that I was supposed to tell people how I really died during my last past life, but I've been putting it off because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do because I didn't stay in showbiz. I was a nobody. Uh, 
I didn't know. I didn't have any kind of public persona, and I certainly wasn't thinking about making YouTube videos, um, or else I could have done this a lot earlier, right? But I just didn't know what to do. Never imagined I could write a book. Didn't even realize self-publishing was a thing. So I just kept putting off, putting off my karma. And then finally, at age 53, back in 2018, I realized, okay, the time is now. I have to tell people how Marilyn really died, which is the whole purpose of writing this book. All right. So my skin cancer karma, or <laughs> skin cancer tr ordeal, trauma karma book. Tongue tied here. Okay, so that's what I was just referring to. Marilyn under the pillow. The coroner got it wrong. So this is talking about the fact that the coroner apparently decided to tell the public that I died, Marilyn died, by probable suicide, but I know different. So I wanted to set things straight and tell people what really happened to me. Chapter number 12, Marilyn, infatuation with those two brothers, Bobby and Jack. Okay, so this is talking about just the things I do remember about Bobby and Jack, which is not a whole lot, but I do remember my mindset. I, I remember little bits and pieces of things. I haven't completely gone into everything in this book because I was grappling with some stuff and, and wasn't sure how much I should put in this book. Um, but I'm just kind of talking about basically how absurd it is to get involved with married men who are, you know, big politicians, who have families, have children, and then, you know, to be caught between two brothers and, and for people to say that Marilyn was never involved with the Kennedys is wrong, but at the same time, to imagine that there was some big love affair is just delusional and crazy as well. I think that being as emotional as I was when I was Marilyn, I may have at moments perceived there was some great love and, and that there was some great loss if things weren't gonna work out with either of the brothers. But I have to be realistic because I knew I was I was where I should not be. I, I should not have gotten involved with married men, period. Politicians are not, brothers are not, all right? So I, I basically talk about my desperation and, and just the way I justified things which is interesting because someone on Facebook who newly friended me asked me recently, well, why did Marilyn get involved with married men? Um, so the next chapter, chapter 13, is about having hallucinations and mental health. And it's called hallucinations, seeing what others don't. And I think that when you have a lot of problems, it's easy to justify doing things that are inappropriate. So that lends itself to the chapter before it in the sense that you can really derail a lot of things in your life if you have constant mental pressure and stress and you're not healthy and you're also not living in a day and age where people are able to diagnose you and help you as readily either and we all have to realize that there were no talk shows on tv helping people with their mental health back in Marilyn's era like there are today. So today, people have so many more opportunities to find healing if they need it. But during Marilyn's time, you kind of thought like, you're either gonna be taken away in a straitjacket or put in an asylum or get a lobotomy or something, you know, you just, you just thought your options were different they, they were limited and it was more fearful at the time to come forward and say, yeah, I really have a mental illness that's even worse than anybody knows. So you actually can go to a psychologist or psychiatrist and take prescription pills, but still be not fully um, forthcoming with the very people who are helping you if you're really afraid to let them know what's going on with you. And so I know that Marilyn had issues that were much deeper than people realize. And again, that kind of plays into making up excuses and getting involved with inappropriate people because you're always clinging to 
a momentary salvation, a momentary thrill, a momentary affirmation that you're all right, instead of really thinking about what you're doing. Chapter 14, My Baby Boy Vanished. You know, a couple people have asked me about this recently online. I don't remember a lot about him, but I do remember a little. This is an extremely short chapter. I just talk about how Marilyn got pregnant and ended up having a baby boy as a teenager and how he was taken away. And um, it's, yeah, it's pretty sad, but it is true. It's not a made up story. I know I've read that some people claim Marilyn told them that she had a baby girl. Some people say she claimed she had a baby boy. And some people think that Marilyn was just making things up just for attention. But I know during that lifetime, I had a baby boy at age 15. I do remember that. Chapter 16, another lifetime revealed, lost but forgotten not. When I was in the process of writing this book, I began to have past life memories about a lifetime that was two lifetimes before Marilyn's. And it was another one where I died young and I was murdered. So I figured I would just honor the woman that I was then and write a chapter about her. Chapter 17, what about nudity, weight, aging, and image? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm 30 pounds heavier than I used to be <laughs> in my like 20s and, and 30s and even early 40s. I'm 56 years old. Okay, here's my image. My hair's all messed up. <laughs> you know, I'm overweight. You know, I'm aging. My, my eyes are a mess now. But you know, hey, you, you got to celebrate who and what you are in the moment at every stage of your life. So, but I did want to talk about this because I think since Marilyn's career hinged so much on her image, I figured it was important that I put something in about these topics. Okay. Chapter 18. What does it mean when I say my soul was Marilyn Monroe's? So I just try to be a little profound, but I talk about what it means to me, which might be different than what you would think it would mean. It doesn't mean patting myself on the back and saying, oh my God, I was really famous and pretty because there's work to be done. When you reincarnate, you got to be in the life you're in now, reflect on the past if you remember any of your past lives, and you got to ask yourself if you're repeating your mistakes, if you're improving at all, you got to live in the now. You can only make now better. You can't go back and rescue the person you used to be, no matter how much it feels like you should be able to. And I think for me, that was a really hard thing to come to grips with. It's, it's the sense of wishing I could go back and rescue some of the people I've been in the past, not just Marilyn, but other people I've been in the past and realizing that's done. If there's any residual energy left over from those lifetimes, any dreams that weren't fulfilled, maybe I can do something now to help, you know, calm that energy down and, and use that creative energy. But I can never go back in time and improve a life that already passed. Now, um, I'm trying to think, was it five lifetimes ago? Let's see, there was Marilyn a woman I call Isidore. I don't really know what her name is. It started with an I. Lizette, Mary, Virginia, Charlotte. Okay, so five lifetimes ago, I lived a life where I wanted to be a fiction writer and I died young and that never happened. So now I feel that even though my books aren't fiction, <laughs> I, I feel that at least I'm a published author now. So in a way, I am helping to fulfill a dream that I had during the early part of the 1800s. And I think that's a wonderful thing. Okay. Chapter 19, final thoughts, cut. That's a wrap. So again, I just put some final thoughts into this book. I really did not know if I was going to write another book after I wrote this one. So this book kind of goes over a long period of time in my life. And, and there's a lot of little stories, but it, it kind of glosses over the landscape of my life 
And then I decided after that I would write book two and book three. <laughs> so each of my books is going to have different stories in it. And yet I think if each book is read in the right order, book one, book two, book three, um, I, th I think everything will make a lot of sense. And I think the, the whole reading experience will be richer. And I think people will understand more who I am today, why I believe what I do about my past lives, how I use my past life memories to kind of help me navigate differently maybe during my current life or how I see that maybe some of the things I'm going through now are because of what I went through them then or maybe I see the pitfalls I'm falling into again and I relate that back to a past life and I say, hey, wake up you got to get better than this. <laughs> you're, you're falling into the old traps, you know? Um, and then the epilogue, things I don't know. And I just kind of am speculating about a couple things or talking about um, things that have come up during online conversations with other people since I started um, joining the reincarnation Facebook sites a few years ago. So this book, it has some pictures in it, but they're all of me, no pictures of Marilyn, not even glamorous shots of me, not sexy shots of me, just, you know, face shots and, and just a couple of little pictures of me throughout the years, just so that when you're reading my story, if you decide to read it, you know who I was at the time, you can picture what I looked like at the time, you know, who was doing this and who was doing that. and. I don't know. I, I, I feel that there's great satisfaction in being able to recall past lives and see maybe, maybe why, why I am the way I am now is part, partially genetic, partially nurture because of the family I grew up in, the friends I have now, the education I had the opportunity to have but also partially because of my spiritual history. Again, I have to say my soul was Marilyn Monroe's during its last past life. I wrote this book, Marilyn, Not Just Another Girl, The Myth About Sleeping in the Nude, because I want people to know how I really died during my last past life. I want them to know I was murdered and I want them to know what I remember. But um, I think that it's, it's a wonderful blessing to remember past lives. I do have a friend who said his past life memories are so powerful. Sometimes he wishes he didn't remember them. So I would just say to you, I read something once where someone said that if you decide to start meditating and past life regressing and really trying to recall your past lives, you got to be prepared for anything. You got to be prepared for drama and trauma. You got to be prepared to find out you were not always the good guy. I read that, I didn't make that up, but it's true. You have to be prepared to find out that sometimes you are not always the good guy. Sometimes you're not always the winner. Sometimes you need forgiveness or your own forgiveness, or, or you may feel that you wish you had someone else's forgiveness because of something that you did during a past life. Um, I think it's important to realize that you don't have to dwell in um, the negative. It's important to move on. I think that that old um, concept of paying things forward is good. You can't change what's happened to you in the past and you can't change what you've done to others in the past, but you can move forward and you can make now better. You can treat people better now. You can treat yourself better now. You can learn to do better now. And I think that's what reincarnation is all about. <laughs> so I am going to say I'm Michelle Somberfield. This is my book called Marilyn, Not Just Another Girl. And um, yeah, I wanted to just show you these nice red shoes I have here because I do love red. <laughs> and um I just wanted to say yeah I do have another leg too like I have I have a left leg too <laughs> um but
but I wanted to say that I'm 56 years old. You are never too old to, I don't know, change your career, to start a new path, to find love, to start wearing brighter colors. Um, you're just never too old. I know one of the things that Marilyn feared was turning 40 in a couple of years and having a career that tanked because her career was so based on image. I remember that. And I think that's why it's important for me to say, look, I'm 20 years older than Marilyn was when she died. During my last past life, I died in 1962. I was born again in 1964. And I'm still here. And I'm still learning and growing, trying to get a hold of, of, of what karma I need to fulfill and trying to move on, move on from Marilyn, move out of her shadow. I think that's important. And I have a, I have a friend, he knows who he is. His name's Kelsey. And he has continually said to me, you are a talented woman now. Get out of Marilyn's shadow. And um, so that's what I'm going to do. But writing my books is awfully fun. So I think it's a wonderful way to kind of dance in Marilyn's shadow <laughs> and, and also learn new things now.